Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton is a groundbreaking autobiography. And Newton was the founder and the leader of the Black Panther Party. And in this autobiography, he shows us the importance of self-education, how to create a revolution and form a massive group of revolutionaries, and how to live a purposeful life. And a very understudied part of American history is studying black nationalistic groups in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It is a wild survey of history if you go down that rabbit hole. The US government, the FBI, foreign countries are interfering with these groups. There are obviously all the same problems that any revolutionary group has when trying to get off the ground. And it is happening in a pretty modern context in America. For instance, when you look at the Simbanese Liberation Army and their story and the climactic finish on national news in Los Angeles or the widespread change that the Black Panther Party brought to the community like a wildfire. It's mind blowing, it's really awesome. And Newton in this book gives us a glimpse inside. But this book is a part of a three book lineage that I think is so important. And it's a huge testimonial to self, self education and the importance. This is obviously a book and writing channel. And those three books are The Autobiography of Malcolm X, Revolutionary Suicide, and Blue Rage, Black Redemption by Tookie Williams, all autobiographies. And then all three, Tookie, Huey and Malcolm have and make these quantum leaps, these revolutionary changes in their mind just through reading and learning alone. And I first want to focus on Huey P. Newton's love of philosophy and psychology and literature. And we'll talk about how he utilized these certain philosophies to create a massive revolutionary group. But I want to read you guys a poem by Huey P. Newton titled Revolutionary Suicide that this book is based off of. It is beautiful. Revolutionary Suicide. By having no family, I inherited the family of humanity. By having no possessions, possessions, I have possessed all. By rejecting the love of one, I received the love of all. By surrendering my, my life to the revolution, I found eternal life. Revolutionary Suicide. And we see a little bit of Mishima coming up here. We see this revolutionary, internal, eternal, immortal spirit. I mean, I'm still talking about him right now. And, you know, obviously that's one of the themes and character, arc, character, 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 characters or archetypes in a revolution is the martyr. And that you know, revolutionary suicide is the most potent thing you can do. If you look at Mishima, if you look at, you know, Jim Jones, even though those weren't really that, those weren't noble deaths. It's a big deal at the time. So Newton was illiterate basically until he got into high school. He was a functioning illiterate. And by the end of high school, he self titles himself as a functioning literate. But then he starts to move into writing because when he was in eighth or ninth grade, he, he had an older, I think, brother or friend who started to recite Shakespeare and really liked Shakespeare. So he started memorizing Shakespeare poems. And this is, you know, something that people miss out on a lot today is actually just the memorization of poems. I watched a weird video on something called the Michaela School in the UK. It's, it's called the strictest school in the UK, but they produce you know, really great students. And one of the things they do is, is that they recite a bunch of poetry every day on command. And for a long time in education and in oral societies, like memorize, and if you look at, you know, obviously Judaism, like memorizing poetry or scriptures was a big deal. But how much do we memorize today? Like I mean, I, we memorize, I guess, sports stat, sports stats and like other things, but memorization isn't as big of a deal anymore. So that's where he gets started. So then when he's, I think, just graduated high school, he starts to read he, um, The Republic by Plato. And that's where his awakening, awakening of consciousness began. He were, went through the Republic word by word and looked up words that he didn't know, talked to a friend about it. And that's where you need to start. And a lot of people don't have the patience. I'm sure, I'm sure when Huey read Plato, I mean the Republic by Plato, it was, it obviously wasn't easy. He talks about that. He had to look up word by word. But if, if you can get through a hard book like that and you do that a couple times, you will become literate, not just literate, but like on the way to being pretty smart. And then if you obviously keep going down that road, you can turn into a genius. And a lot of people, it's like working out though for the first time. I know so many people that if I gave them the Republic by Plato right now, that's what they would have to do. They would have to grind it out. And if you've taken a long time off from reading or and you've been doing other things or just never done it, done, you know, read challenging books, it's going to be hard. But once you get through it, then you become one more interested and it's just more fun. So during this time though, Newton is, you know, being a criminal, he's in and out of college, he's causing some trouble, but he starts finding some of the famous black literature of the time, The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. He sees Malcolm X speak. And these are big deals. And like the Malcolm X factor, like seeing Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay and Malcolm X 
are big deals for someone who is young and being educated and they're on the path to we could say even becoming a radical you know a, ge a genius radical being around and having moments with some of the big figures in the movement is always a big thing if you talk about it if you read about it there's always these figures in these in like for malcolm it was elijah muhammad someone to talk to someone to idolize someone to look up to but newton rejected the nation of islam and malcolm because he was an atheist he would, was done with religion he had explored christianity and he knew it was all bs rightfully so and he didn't get caught up in that and that's one of the reasons that the black panther party in my opinion opinion is going to be more successful than like the nation of islam or even martin luther king's movements is it's not going to be as tied to religion and with the religious ties always create a lot of problems sometimes in a good way sometimes it obviously makes people more measured but also can make them more extreme so eventually newton starts to graduate to some to, you know okay so when you start reading and becoming literate you that's like a whole new world but then there's certain pathways there's certain pathways that most people take and you know, at some level determines the rest of your life especially at this right that ripe age of 18 19 20 21 whatever direction you take you see a lot of times people carry that for decades even though they know a lot and newton takes a more detached view because first of all he's studying pavlov pavlov and john watson and bf skinner he's studying those old the old time psychologists, you know, the behaviorists and people like that, because, oh my God, this is so important because Newton loved to hypnotize people. He was a master as a kid and as middle school, elementary school, high school at hypnotizing people. And that's like a weird skill to have. That's actually, should mention that that's like a weird thing. Like a lot of people don't think they can be hypnotized, but if you are confronted by a good hypnotist, they can do it a lot of the time. You have to resist very hard. And sometimes your resistance is what gets you hypnotized. And especially like, you know, most hypnotists, you know, it's not in front of a crowd. You might just be hanging out with someone. They say they can do it. And then, you know, there's because there's a lot of factors that can go into it. On, in a crowd scenario with hypnotism, things need to work fast and they pick targets to do it on. But in a more of a relaxed setting, people can like touch you and create anchors in the conversation. It's actually kind of screwed up like neuro-linguistic programming. Like people, you know, can control conversations and even hypnotize people without their consent. And that's obviously wrong. So, but that, that takes you that, so when, if you can hypnotize people though, it kind of gives you a different perspective on the human mind because I've dabbled in hypnotism and been hypnotized, hypnotized other people. And it can lead to more detachment because you're like, we're just a bunch of, we can just be hypnotized. You know, we're just, we're nothing, you know, we're just in these reality tunnels that can get changed. And what starts to fuel that is obviously his hatred of religion and logical positivism, pos, pos, positivism, excuse me. Just did leg day at the gym, everyone. I'm <laughs> stumbling over my words. So. Right now, I'm going to read you guys a quote from Newton about how logical positivism influenced him and eventually the Black Panther Party. I was also impressed with A.J. Iyer's logical positivism, particularly his distinction between three kinds of statements, the analytical statement, the synthetic statement, and the statements of assumption. These ideas have helped me develop my own thinking and ideology. Ayer once said, nothing can be real if it cannot be conceptualized, articulated, and shared. That notion stuck with me and became very important when I began to use the ideological method of dialectical materialism as a worldview. The ideal, ideology of the Black Panthers stands on that premise and proceeds on that basis to conceptualize, articulate, and share. Some key aspects of Black Panther ideology and rhetoric, like all power to the people and the concept pig developed out of that. They were not haphazardly introduced into our thinking or vocabulary. And yes, because when you are a guy like Huey Newton, for instance, and you know, these are different type, these guys like Newton were on a different level because one of the reasons the Black Panther Party started, broke apart and had so many problems is because when, for instance, Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton were, were arrested at the same time with a bunch of other Black Panthers because they were doing these massive protests and doing things, the movement started to splinter because people like Eldred, Eldred's Cleaver and other more radical types or people who weren't as into education or were more violent or more aggressive took over and that started to create more problems and rifts in the community and groups in other cities that never even had, you know, that just had upstarts or you know, drug dealers or people with problems running those chapters because it was kind of the wild west in terms of revolutionary movements. A lot of problems happened and that's, you know, one, one of the more unfortunate parts of the history of all this and obviously some of that was because of F FBI interference. Um, in interference from businesses and po local police forces. But you guys get what I mean, that a guy like Huey P. Newton, who, as we are going to keep talking about, like really had grand ideas and really worked hard to develop ideology and ideas and become a character to embody this. He's the leader, but he can't, you know, stay up here in the ephemeral. He has to conceptualize, articulate, and share 
all these ideas and bring it to the people, bring it to everybody who, you know, it doesn't matter what type of education you have. And like you just said, you know, the words weren't haphazardly introduced, you know, something like pig that is very easy. It's very easy to resonate with. If you are feel like you're being oppressed by the police, it's very easy word for, you know, obviously what's worse than a pig. We look at all power to the people. That's very simple. You know, the people have the power. That's a mnemonic idea that's very easy obviously for the masses to get behind because it says the people power and people and then all you know we have an absolute we have the characters which is the mass and then we have them being identified as the people single you know a singular world with word which is also plural you know a lot of things are going on here and that's when you know when we have these dialectical materialists they did this time and time again with communi communism and socialism all across the world they were so good at doing this with this this method works in terms of riling people up and getting a movement going and you know having them you know take certain actions i mean we actually have seen a reoc a lot of this type, a lot of this type of stuff come back with a lot of modern politics right now we see words like pig you know that one's still around obviously but you know these slogans and these words and when you see the protests on tv they all they have the same chance and the people who are making up these chants and running these groups we i'm sure some people would like to think that they are dumb or maybe they're smart but they, I, they're usually pretty smart in terms of knowing what to do to gather people to protest something or, you know, for a cause and direct people in a certain way. So another big thing that actually adds to all this. So like I said earlier, we're talking about pathways, right? And Newton with all this falls into the existentialist pathway because during this whole time he was exploring the existentialist. And I don't know if you guys know about the existentialist, um, Camus, Sartre. Kierkegaard, they are, you know, they are detached. They, you know, they don't talk about living a wild life, but when you get into the, like I, I went down this path. So when you enter exis, existentialist philosophy, it's easy, easier to be a rambler. It's easier to be, you know, searching and longing and um, trying being angry against the system and fall and fall into substance abuse and, you know, hitchhiking around. These are all things that I've done before. And all my friends who got into existentialism, either they do that or they just have terrible mental health issue crises all the time. And you know, this is, if we actually wanna go deeper, this is actually in, in terms of lineages and archetypes, this is actually the Ecclesiastes lineage of the Bible, you know, because the Bible is the canonical piece of Western literature, like it or not. And this is, follows that lineage, you know, the preacher and Ecclesiastes, um, you know, existentialism and a lot of revolutionary movements in the 20th, 20th century, we could say we're, we're following that path. You know, there are many paths obviously in the Bible and in life in general. Another thing that, you know, if you go down the existentialist path, another thing that happens to a lot of people who go through that wormhole is that they become socialists or communists. It's just a very high rate of people. And that's obviously a big part because eventually the Black Panther Party basically, you know, heads toward Leninism and Marxism. And dialectical materialism is one of the cornerstones and foundational pieces of a lot, once again, of communist movements. And if we're talking, you know, and I guess I should have mentioned this is that it's, we should be calling him Dr. You know, Dr. Newton, because Dr. Newton got a PhD in social philosophy at the University of Santa Cruz. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. You know, getting a PhD is, is hard. And, you know, you have to be smart to get a PhD. And I mean, I, this goes without mention, but we have to mention the works of a lot of the communist people at the time. So when you go down the, I, this is what happened to me. I went down the existentialist rabbit hole, rabbit hole. I read everything that he's talking about. And then you start falling into, you know, uh, che Guevara, Marx, Lenin, Franz Fanon, Malcolm X, even, you know, he was going into Mao and to other people. He was calling, they were, um, you know, Mao was still a person that people were looking up to and like liking back then. Still, I had a student the other day, you guys will blow your mind. 14 year old kid tells me that he's a Maoist. I'm like, you're trolling me. Like, I thought it was a joke. Like, oh, he's like, no, I'm, I'm a Maoist. Then I asked him about it and he gave me a 10 minute explanation why. I was like, all right, man. I guess you are then. So the, the Black Panther Party actually starts off with a very good, I would say a very nice agenda. The 10, so they start off um, Newton and Bobby Seale with this 10 point program. That's what they really are pushing for the first couple of years and for a while. So if, I mean, if we look at some of these, you know, we want freedom. We want the power to determine the destiny of black and oppressed communities. We want employment, housing, shelter, um, the end of the robbery of black and oppressed people, education, healthcare, the end of police brutality, the end of all wars in other countries. They want to retry um, all people of color in jails with their own juries. And then just basically other, you know, forms of um, social programs. And this, this is a very common thing. And this is where a lot of these movements start and they start here. But obviously what happens if you're rejected? And we can all say, hey, we want, we want all free healthcare and food and housing and like send the drug war and like, 
not give money to other countries for wars? Like, let's end all that. But what, what if you just get a big fat no? And you've been getting a no for 100 years. Hundreds of years. Poor people since the start of time have been getting told no about this. Well, you know, now we're going down the Gracchi cycle, you know, going back to Rome. So here we go. Well, we're going to start to push. The, we're going to start pushing the limits now. And so the ten, that's what started to happen. So the 10 point program, they thought that they could get the black community on board. with just this program. Tell people this way, you know, let's have them vote, have them do things. Let's start aggre being aggregates and you know, making community. But what you realize, though, is that a lot of people are lazy and, you know, can't make that happen or like are not down for that cause. They need you to make it happen. For them, you know, it's the society we live in now. We have to hire a government. We have to hire, you know, all these different types of people. You know, you hire one group to run everything for us. And Newton is so successful at starting to create this movement, though. And he is successful with this 10-point program because he's actually using philosophy to talk to people. He was, you know, just like Malcolm, he was an activated individual. And he could talk to anyone. And he would talk to anyone and argue with them and try to get them on board. And, you you know, you start to, you're able to set traps after talking to people about, like, why aren't you involved? Why aren't you, do you not care? Blah, blah, blah. You know, there's all these different things that you can start to recruit people with. And if he's a hypnotist and understands neuro-linguistic programming and philosophy and all these things, that's how you start growing this movement. Because he actually needs that padding because someone like Malcolm could do it through religion. You know, if you have the religion backing, then you can create, you know, a group of zealots. But if you don't have that, then you need to have a different dream. You have to have a different, you know, utopian um, pitch, you know, these are pitches. These guys are, you know, Malcolm and Newton. When you're a, you don't have a movement, you're basically being a salesman out there. Like, hey, let me join my movement. I'm the leader. That just gives me anxiety thinking about having to go around and trying to get a bunch of people. So, long story short, the the movement starts to grow, and at some point, Newton gets thrown in jail for six months for for stabbing somebody with a steak knife, which he did. And we're about to see this. So, another downfall of these movements is that Newton, for instance, is a violent individual he is not a good person you know i i guess i should have said that earlier but newton is you know we're about to see him be involved with maybe the murder of a police officer he's going to kill a prostitute he's going to beat up a bunch of other people for no reason we'll talk about the reasons but so the next big thing is the killing of officer frey so newton is pulled over an officer comes to talk to them they get into a firefight and um another officer comes and Newton claims that he lo loses consciousness, that he lost consciousness and has no idea what happened. And the, no gun was found on him. There was no gun found anywhere. So there was no gun that they used to shoot this officer. And But one of the officers lived and said that they were shooting at them with guns. That officer got hit three times. The other one ended up dying. And Newton got released, I think, three years later in 1970. So he was involved with the death of an officer, supposedly. And he got three years in prison. You know, that's actually a pretty good, pretty good amount of time. I think, if I remember correctly, because the, the, the pullover was incorrect, there was like a lot of stuff. So he got a voluntary manslaughter charge. So then there's a weird section where Newton goes to China. You know, in this autobiography, it's like one of these things before Nixon ever went and spends a lot of time in China, meets Mao's wife, meets a bunch of high-ranking officials. And they love him because he's a the head of a communist socialist movement. And Newton says that, hey, everything's going okay over here. It's a great communist country. But now we know about everything that Mao did and all the big problems that, you know, people that died. So I don't know if he's selling wolf tickets there or just he didn't see it, but he's obviously probably trying to sell his wolf tickets about socialism. And actually one of my favorite stories of Huey P. Newton is actually his cousin, Stanley, is one of the few people to have escaped the Jonestown massacre. He was there when it happened and he ran into the bushes and was like, what the hell? You know, was probably like, what the hell is going on here? I'm not doing this. And he's one of the only people who have escaped that massacre who was there at the time. And Newton was a supporter of the Jonestown movement. So he was in cahoots. Everyone in San Francisco was actually in cahoots with Jim Jones. Jim Jones, if you look, there was a lot. He was involved with all these movements. He was involved with Harvey Milk. And um, I think Diane Feinstein got shot at Jonestown. And if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, Diane Feinstein actually got shot in the head at Jonestown because she, she went down there as an assistant to, you know, I think the congressman who went down there and she's a senator of california right now so the connections kind of never end oh and jones was friends with willie brown and like was you know involved with willie brown who helped kamala harris she, that was kamala's boyfriend or husband who helped her get into politics and give her you know help her rise up to you know being an attorney general and a general because i he was the mayor of san francisco lots of you know interesting connections here but that's what happens in a small town, you know, not San Francisco is not small, but if you're involved in a major city's politics, you know, everyone is involved with each other. So allegedly Huey P. Newton murdered a prostitute, you know, we're just going to conclude and talk about because he didn't like being called baby. And apparently there was um, 
multiple people who multiple people that he beat up or hurt killed or hurt badly who called him baby a name that he didn't like and when i read about the trial i've read about the trial it it seems like a fishy trial multiple witnesses got killed or were chased down and shot and like almost killed he changed his testimony several times and he ended up getting acquitted so you know i obviously can't say anything but and the juries were actually deadlocked they actually didn't you know they hung juries multiple times so Anyway, everybody, that is my video on Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. I would give this book a 7 out of 10. And if you guys are interested in black nationalism or self-education in general and what it can do, do for you and some of the ins and outs and problems that can happen in a revolutionary movement, then this is a great book to check out because the Black Panther Party is one of the more successful examples of a revolutionary movement in the 20th century in America.